out how to uh, preset our live stream so that you guys could find us before it was time because uh, it's great to have you guys here so we can get started right away. Uh, Sam is working on getting all the kids where they need to be uh, so that we can go ahead and have a nice chat. We're talking about food preservation today, which I'm super excited about. It is a passion of mine, and I don't know why we haven't done a live stream on this before because I could talk about this for hours. So I'm excited to have everyone here. Let's see who's here today. Let's see. Beth, welcome. Thank you for joining us. And you were like five minutes early. Uh, Carrie is here from Pennsylvania. Aunt Holly, welcome. And Sam did have a great Father's Day. Um, so we got Debbie and Janice and Homestead Nana is here, all the way from Massachusetts, and Grandpa Dan and Carrie. Welcome. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, so, oh, and Pam. Welcome, Pam. Uh, so anyway, food preservation, basically just to give it a roundabout definition here. So we're going to be talking about ways to take things that normally have short-term shelf life, like under a month, and how you can make them last a year or more. Um, and we're going to talk about several different ways to do it. So if you are not interested in learning how to can, there are other ways. If you are not wanting to invest in a large deep freezer, there are other ways. So we're just going to be talking about a bunch of different varieties. Um, we may not get to everything I have on my list today. This may end up having a part two. Um, we'd love to answer any questions that you have too as we go along. We're going to just pace it according to how things are going. And if this has to be a 10-part series, then it'll be a 10-part series. So um, welcome Tara and Allison and Refining Roots. Thanks for joining us. And Debbie and ZC from Minnesota. We moved from Connecticut back to Minnesota. And unfortunately, you traded one short growing season for another shorter growing season, probably. But I hope you are settling in well. So. I feel like I got it tilted. I think right. we're okay. Is it right? Our tripod, our tripod is tilty and our house is tilty, so it's really hard to get a straight picture. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I'm trying. All right. We ready? Yeah. All right. So when we talk about uh, food preservation, preservation and long-term storage, first thing I want to always bring up is um, a lot of times people think that prepping just means that you are fearful or the only reason you're doing that is because you think the economy is going to blow up tomorrow and we're all going to be living in like post-apocalyptic world and it tends to be when you look up prepping type channels that's all they talk about. We believe in prepping just as a matter of common sense. I think if you look through all of human history this very short last 50 years is the first time people haven't been like, hmm, maybe I should plan farther ahead than two weeks for what food is in my house. So we really are looking just to uh, what, we, what I like to call sensible prepping. Like life has ups and downs and you have times when things are going better and times when things are going worse. And you should really be using those better times to plan ahead for those harder times so that your food supply or your ability to get good nutritious food doesn't drop if you have some sort of um, you know, emergency that you weren't planning for, a lost job, an illness. Um, you know, There's all sorts of things that um, we can not plan for and that can affect our ability to um, provide food for our families. So with long-term food preservation, we're going to take um, the, the time when we have the time when things are looking good, when everything's going well, maybe you have a little extra income or a little extra time, and we're going to go ahead and plan for those times when things are not as awesome. So, uh, yes, Silver Moon, thanks for joining us. Irene, thanks for joining us as well. So all that to say is that prepping isn't crazy. It's the not prepping that's a little crazy. And I hope that all of you, after listening to us or watching any of our videos, we talk about this a lot, really understand that um, prepping should just be like a way of life. It should be part of your chores that you think about each month. Am I putting food out uh, to plan for what could be in my future for the ups and the downs. So Debbie says, prepping because you never know what might happen, loss of a job, illness, weather, and so forth. Exactly. Um, my paternal grandmother was born in 1916. She lived through a flu pandemic, World War I, Great Depression, World War II, Korean and Vietnam Wars, the Cold War. I mean, lots of ups and downs. And if there's one thing that I remember her teaching me, um, is that she basically was always planned ahead. When she baked one meal, she would make two more and put them in her freezer for the future, for maybe if she didn't have time or money to do that um, in the future. And she was just always kind of stocked ahead, and that's just how she lived her life. She wasn't a fearful person. Life just taught her that you plan ahead a little bit. So 
Okay. I think, okay. I do think, just to like preface all of it, I do think the fact that, like, this is Laura's baby, by the way. Like, she does all the canning and the gardening and like all of it, really. That, that portion of our homestead. But uh, all of her hard work and all of her education and trying to learn and figure out how to do this stuff, like, I think it's really applicable for our life right now. Because life is really crazy for us with me going to school and studying all day. And then Laura and the girls, or some of the girls, it depends what day it is, are gone all day for Annie's uh, therapy. But the fact that we do have food preserved and ready, um, it's not only... Like, sometimes it's just a convenience thing, honestly. I mean, it saves money, but also it's convenient because you, you always, you kind of can go grocery shopping in your pantry. If I decided I didn't want to go grocery shopping for several months, probably, we would be fine. I mean, we might not be eating all of our favorite things, yeah, you know. we'd be but, eating a lot of the same stuff. But, but we would be fine, you know, and that's just, that just feels comforting to There's a few different know, benefits so. to it, anyway. I just wanted to interject uh, so Beth says that's the same year my grandma was born. She saved everything, and the freezer was always stocked. You know exactly. And even when it was just my grandma and grandpa, you know, when nobody else was living at home, and you know the grandkids were all kind of grown up, like she, her freezer was always fully stocked, and so was her pantry. That was just her way of life. Hello so. from California. And Beth says people laugh now for having a stocked pantry, and the prices start going up, and don't have to go to the. Yeah, and you don't have to go to the store for everything. So exactly. Uh, I remember two years ago, I made a video. I raw packed um, potatoes. And somebody made a comment on it like, why would you waste your time doing that? Potatoes are like 30 cents a pound or something like that at that time. But I'm, I'm glad I did it. Um, and I do it every year because now potatoes are like four or five times that much. And, you know, I have my pantry well sucked. I don't have to worry about that pricing. Debbie? Debbie says... Oh. Daddy's eyes are not as good as mommy's. Let's see. Debbie says, I stuck up, stock up on rice, beans, rice, flour, noodles, canned foods, spices and flour, sugar, and so forth. I stock up a lot of stuff. I can go two months or longer. Awesome. Nice. Uh, Silver Moon says, life is not easy. Preparing for the bumps is just smart. Like, you just never know when you might, like, break a leg or something silly that... You know, I, life life's going to happen. Yeah, very true. And Charlie and Judy are here. Thank you for, for joining us. For some homesteading wisdom. Charlie, uh, Judy, by the way, has the absolute best pickles recipe, which I am going to ask her permission if we can share that with you because it is the best pickles on this earth. I make them every year. So yeah. that video may be coming up if Judy says that's okay. And uh, Joyce says, my mom was born a few years later and always kept a stockpile. She didn't can purchase only sale items, so we kept stock. And Tammy says, I don't get a check during the summer. She's a sub-teacher. Prep for that every year at a bit of time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's an also a good exactly. plan. And uh, I just want to say what we're going to talk about, if you don't grow a thing, if you live in a city and don't even have a patio to grow a single pot on, this still can apply to you. I do not just can or just freeze or just whatever um, things that I grow. I look for good deals at the grocery store and I snag them then and put it up. So and you it, can do all of this just you know at your local grocery store watching prices and it doesn't mean that when you go to the grocery store either that you buy 80 pounds of potatoes like it can just be you buy a little bit of something each time you're there even if it's something as silly as like sardines or mm -hmm. you, you know uh canned chicken or something like that and if you buy just a little bit extra or you know whatever vegetable mm -hmm. you want to can you buy a little bit extra each time it's not going to kill your budget you might find stuff on sale uh, it might not be as overwhelming to deal with. Uh, there's a channel I like to watch. Her name's Jordan Page, and her saying is always buy one for now, two for later when it comes to shelf things that are long-term shelf-stable, like, you know, pastas and rices and things, so that you, that way you start growing your pantry just a few dollars at a time. Uh, but today we're specifically going to talk about things that don't have long shelf lives and giving them long shelf li lives. So um, pickle recipe is approved. Don't worry, Carrie. That is now definitely on my list it is the best it's sweet and spicy uh pickles they oh, are so good you, you just can, eat them by the jar you can literally put them so. on anything and with anything and i swear it makes it better it's so. oh it's so good okay so we're gonna break this apart into four categories and we'll see how far we get tonight but my four categories of preserving food long term is freezing them 
hardening them off, canning, and dehydrating. And in this dehydrating category, I'm going to include uh, like the ideas of um, vacuum sealing, things that are already dry like flowers, and um, you could even throw freeze drying in there. Though I would assume if you watch our channel a lot and you're here, you probably do not have a freeze dryer or the financial capacity to buy a freeze dryer they are very maybe, expensive maybe <laughs> so, sometime in the future that is pretty cool off. though they there's some really channels cool. that have them and they are really neat i know um, some people like some homesteads they'll like pool it together mm -hmm. and so they'll have like four or five families go in on one and then just kind of pass it around and use it because they are useful but they yeah. are pricey yeah, Tara's here, and Rachel was talking about how they want a freeze dryer. So maybe the three of us, we could all oh, yeah. uh, go see. in on one. Uh, Irene said that her lone tomato plant didn't make it. Overwatered it. You know, that it happens, happens, and you've learned your lesson, like, for next year, and you can try something new. So Silverman that's okay. Silverman says, pickles have good probiotics for you. Yes, you could drink that pickle juice. And Joyce says, this year I am planting in pots and containers, but working on clearing ground for next year's garden. Yeah, you can never start thinking about next year's garden, like, too far yeah. in the future. And especially now, if you put down cardboard or tarps or something, really kill that grass by next year, you really can get in there without having to do a lot of digging or tilling. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Do some preparation. Okay, so let's talk first about, um, we'll actually talk about canning first, because that's what I've got set up here. Um, so canning, get down to the bottom of my page here, um, canning, there we go. basically we're talking about either water bath or pressure canning. And the reason I really, really, really like canning, it's probably my favorite way of long-term preservation, is because you can take almost anything that is perishable and make it shelf stable for years. And I know everybody thinks about canning green beans and spaghetti sauce and jellies because that's kind of like that's kind of what's always on the cover of the ball magazine mm -hmm. you think those kind of things but there are so many things you can can and i just want to show you a couple odd oddities i'll call them that i pulled out of my um, pantry just to keep your wheels going on the sort of things you could be thinking about so last year you know like every american i grew way more zucchini than we could eat in a summer and so i canned a bunch of it and you know just today for lunch I popped open a can and drained it and fried it up with some potatoes and like kielbasa like sausage and some tomatoes and we yeah, just had like good. a, I don't know what you call it, like a, it's almost like a jambalaya sort of, yeah, I don't I know. know. It, it was, was good. good. <laughs> and um, or everything you it. could um, just fry them up. We also like them <clears> fried up um, with some just like cheese on top, like some Asiago cheese. It's really good. Um, or you can bake them into a soup or a casserole, but you know, if just like um, if you plant your zucchini plants and you feel like, oh my gosh, now I have 50 zucchinis that are the size of baseball bats and you're trying to, to put them on neighbor's porches and run away as fast as possible to get rid of them, pressure canning them is a really good way to preserve them. They don't freeze super well. The texture gets really weird. Um, the really big ones will last on your counter for several <clears throat> months, actually. We learned that. Yeah. Um, I would, I, but, uh, Tara asked that question, too. Mm -hmm. How's the texture on the zucchini? With a lot of the canned stuff, I would say the texture does kind of change. And so there's some things, they might not be as good just, like, popping them in your mouth and eating them. But if you're going to mix them or put them in, in something. something or cook them another way, like, they're great. And it, the convenience of it is awesome to just be able to pop it open and warm it up. Mm -hmm. But some of that stuff, yes, the so texture does change. I don't bit. feel like on the zucchini that the texture really ch changed. It's like a cooked zucchini, like a steamed zucchini. I would say the big texture changes are really on the meat products. That's true. I feel like is when you really notice the texture change. Okay, <laughs> the other thing I canned, uh, these are this is pumpkin. I chopped up into chunks, so this could be turned into pumpkin pie. You could put the broiler on in your oven with a little bit of brown sugar and cinnamon and, and broil roast them. Um, pumpkin is one of those things we have Halloween and then we're like oh what do I do with this pumpkin and you know throw it in the backyard uh, but you could actually pumpkins are food and lots of places around mm -hmm. the world people eat them regularly so I can pumpkin. It's something we really only eat in the late summer and fall because it's kind of a fall flavor. But That's true. It's in my pantry. Uh, who and missed? we missed Ann up there. And welcome. Um, my pantry and freezer are well stocked. I've been in the hospital for 11 days now and will be oh, wow. here a bit longer. My husband and son can find a variety of meals in the freezer and pantry. Well, I hope that you get to go home yeah. soon. I'm sorry to hear that you've been in the hospital. Thanks for joining us. Yes. <clears throat> um, I'll watch this later. Life just happened. All right, take care, <laughs> Pam. Hang in there.
Uh, hello, Jeffco. Welcome. And Tara, it's okay. I use them in casseroles. Exactly. So they're perfect for that. And it's already pre-cooked, so you just kind of chop and then throw it in and just warm it up. So zucchini relish is amazing. Yes, that's another thing you could can with zucchini. Uh, something else I like to do with the zucchini is I, when they're fresh, I chop them up and bread them like eggplant and then make a zucchini eggplant parmesan uh, for dinner, and that's pretty good. Um, okay. The other one, so this is green tomato salsa verde. It's not true salsa verde because it's green tomatoes and not tomatillas or tomatillos, however you say that. But um, this is a fun way to use up those tomatoes you pull out of the garden right before the first frost. And then I have, the only thing I use these for is I have a chicken enchilada soup that I make in the crock pot. And it uses one can of salsa verde and that's what, this is my last can. So I will need more green tomatoes this year. But, um... Last thing here I want to show you too is ham. It's not spam. It's not spiced ham. This is just regular ham that has been uh, just sliced in pressure can. And then I'll open this up and fry it up like breakfast ham or add it to like a cheesy potato casserole in the crock pot. And it's just great um, because when we buy our whole hog every year, we get so much ham and I can only fit so much in my freezer. So I'll take about a quarter of it and I'll just can it and then it's it's ready it doesn't have to be defrosted i just pop the lid and drain it and then add it to whatever i'm cooking mm -hmm. so uh, let's see what do we got uh fried irene sends Anne her well wishes and then debbie says fried cabbage with tomatoes and zucchini and squash and onions and a little chicken that broth sounds good. Yum. silver moon says you can pickle zucchini and squash really good blythe Hi from Northwest Indiana. Great topic, just getting started on my canning journey. Awesome. And Homestead, Nana says, I take a quart jar, put some type of meat in the bottom, then potatoes and veg. Can it all up and when you need something fast, I open one up and fry it in a little butter. Just enough for me and Papa. Perfect. All your canning is so impressive. Oh, thank you. And you start little, like if you're watching this, you've never canned anything mm -hmm. before. Like my first year canning, I think I canned green beans and spaghetti sauce and that's all I did. And each year it's gotten bigger and bigger. And, and part of it is because like, I genuinely enjoy doing it. It does not feel like a chore. The kids really like to help. Um, a lot of people are very nervous about canning, and I was too before I was started. You know, you've always heard that story. You know, oh, my grandma's sister exploded her house with her canner. I will tell you that canning accidents happen because people make mistakes. So you have to be really regimented every time you can. You have to make sure you check your safety list and it'll come with your canner. It'll tell you in the insert of the manual of your canner what things to check on your particular canner, like the seals or the valves, like and how to check them. You do and that every time. If you're time. buying a used one, you could probably find Google it online. It, look, yeah. look online with your whatever it is you've got. And then you also want to make sure that you always, always, always let it depressurize down to zero when you are done. Do not get in a hurry to take that lid off. Make sure it's like all the way to zero, even wait till it's cool to the touch and then remove the lid. Because if you think about it, even two pounds of pressure inside your canner, that's an incredible that's amount of weight right. if you jiggle the, if you manage to force the lid loose, that's gonna explode the top right off, just two pounds. And you think about a canner needs to be up to 11 or 12. I mean, that's an incredible amount of pressure on the inside. So don't be in a hurry to take the lid off. So do you have our zucchini relish recipe? I do not, Charlie. Tell Judy to send that my way, so. So, uh, sorry, the baby is crying because Sam just walked by him. He will be okay. <laughs> so, he was happy playing until he realized somebody walked by and didn't pick him up. Uh, let's see. Blythe says, just can strawberry jam and hearing the pop is very satisfying. Yes, it always makes me happy when you hear all the lids pop down. And Silvermoon says, I don't usually can a lot because I'm usually outside. But with the heat coming on, I'm forced to stay inside. Time to up my canning game. Yes. Oh, and also... If you live somewhere where um, it's possible for you, a lot of people like to actually can outside on like a camping stove because it doesn't heat up your whole kitchen. I don't do that because um, for me, um, I don't, whatever. I'd rather be inside canning. It's easier to keep an eye on the kids and make sure they're staying away from the canner. The little kids aren't allowed to help, um, but a lot of people do can outside. It's a way to prevent your whole house from getting hot. So um, some of the, let's talk about pros and cons. So the biggest, pros for canning is that once you've made your initial investment it's basically free other than the energy every year um, if you are using disposable lids you'll need to buy new lids but they're really inexpensive 
um, your jars you reuse over and over and over again, your cannery you reuse over and over and over again. So once you've made your investment, you've really put your money in and then you can just go, go, go. If you look, uh, I don't know if you said this because I'm jumping in here. If you look too, you can find a lot of your things like used or really cheap. If you go to auctions or pay attention to Craigslist or the Facebook marketplace, you can find, um, you know, your jars and things like that really cheap. You know, someone just, you know, has boxes and boxes and, you know, mm -hmm. you might have to pitch some of them, but there might be a lot yep. in there. I have gotten a save. lot of free jars over the year from people who know that I can. So, yes, Pat and you have a fan club. They all say hi. <laughs> um, and then, uh, and Bly, give them a smile? Bly, thank you for saying that because I'll clarify. When I say canning outside, I mean they have their canning stove outside. They'll prep all their food inside. You obviously want to keep it sanitary. You don't want flies getting in your jar. Um, but they'll prep everything inside, but then they'll actually have the canner outside where all the heat Yay, is. Um, I really meant to load the comment section on here with Yay. links for you to click on if you're interested in more information. I will go back and do that as soon as this is over. But Yay. if you are brand new and you want to start canning, you want to check out the National Center for Home Food Preservation. It is a great Your website. It has step-by-step -step instructions for anything that is considered safe to can. Um, and that is kind of a contention term. Every time I make a canning video, there's if there's one type of video that gets commenters all hot and bothered, it's canning. People are very opinionated. Um, and a lot of people feel like the USDA and the National Center for Home Food Preservation, that they are too conservative on what they say is safe to can, and it discourages people from canning things that are safe to can. Um, basically, you just have to remember that the USDA, National Center for Home Food Preservation, if you're watching this from the U.S., they are only going to recommend things to can if they can absolutely, positively guarantee that if you follow their steps, that it will be safe 100% of the time. If they don't have enough data in order to present that to you, they're not going to put something up and say, we are pretty sure it's safe because we've never seen somebody get sick. Um, so. Just keep that in mind. As you get more and more into canning, you'll come across people that they call themselves rebel canners and they can absolutely everything from dairy to butter to soups with thickeners, things that are really considered hot and nose don't go there in the traditional canning category. And you will have to decide for yourself what you feel safe doing. I pretty closely stick to the National Center for Home Food Preservation Guidelines. The only thing that I do that is not recommended is I do can zucchini squash. Um, but that is only not recommended. It used to be recommended and then they pulled it because they didn't have enough data to prove it was safe. I feel comfortable canning that. You have to make your own decisions. Oh, uh, let's see. Carrie so. says, I do my canning outside. I can yeah, four canners yeah. going at once. That's awesome. That would make a very hot house. <laughs> so. uh, let's see. Cammy <laughs> says, been canning spaghetti squash today. Eight quarts. Nice. Cutting up plums for jam and puree. Awesome. Salsa on Thursday. Ooh. Oh, and here's a, um, oh, Bly says, when is the best time to can produce or fruit? Not ripe, ripe to eat, overripe. It just depends what you're canning. And the National Center of Food Preservation, which I'll link when we're done here, they have, and it'll say in the instructions, pick fruit that is um, at the best stage of ripeness or pick fruit that is uh, just not quite ripe. It really depends what you're canning. Uh, the general rule, though, I don't think there's anything that you can you want to overwrite because what will happen is you can it, it's just going to fall apart. Canning is just like, Goodness, imagine putting something so in a crock pot and cooking it for 24 hours. Like, it's going to cook it that much. So, um, but yeah, if you look if you look at the recipe, it, it will pretty clearly define that for you. So, uh, yeah, Silver Moon, if you want to grab that link, you can put it up there for us now. Thank you. Um, yeah. 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 Go ahead. Go for it. Go for it if you can find it. Um, the biggest cons of canning is there is a learning curve, so you really want to make sure that you read all of the instructions. Like they have a section on the website for beginner canners. You read all of that before you try to do anything. You also need to invest in a canner. I'll link my canner in the description. I have a good, what I would call basic canner. It's a 23 quart Presto. It holds about seven quart jars. The 23 quart is the complete volume um, of liquid it can hold, not how many jars it holds. Um, there are much larger canners um, that are out there, but they are much more expensive. The Presto, I think when I bought it, was $130. Much larger canners, you could be spending four or 500 which is a humongous investment. And um, I wouldn't recommend making that investment unless you're sure that you really, really want a can. So. Uh, let's see. Hi from far no north. Idaho. 
Thank you. So the Pioneer Homestead. Thanks for joining us. And All right, Silver so, Moon put it up there. Thank you, Silver Moon. Debbie says, I've seen people use an electric canner. Ooh. So one thing you want to be really careful of, in my opinion, and people will disagree with me, but you can uh, find pressure canner cookers or pressure cookers. I would not can in a pressure cooker, an electric pressure cooker. I would only can in something that was labeled a pressure canner slash cooker. It's gotta have that canner in there. It has to do with how the seal is rated. Um, I would just be really careful. Um, would it probably be okay? Probably, but when it comes to that amount of time, the pressure for that amount of time, meats, we're talking 90 minutes in the canner. I would make sure that I was 100% sure that what I was doing was safe. Um, so he's uh, a very Tammy, happy boy. He's a happy boy, but he's a ham. He's looking at himself on camera. <laughs> he sees himself. And he's getting excited. So So um, I will link. I have an entire canning playlist. <laughs> we tried, I try to vlog anything that I can so that people, you know, if you're looking, how do I can baked beans or how do I can ham or whatever, like I have a video for it. I will link that after this. Um, so that if you just want to peruse through. The other question I get a lot is, hey, nice. what's the easiest thing to can to start Little with? Stinker. And the truth is Little that stinker. really nothing is easier. It's kind of all the same. I don't know. It's not like cooking where there can be a different amount of steps. Most things you can, it's the same amount of steps. It's just about how long it sits in the canner. So if you don't know what to start with, think about what you would like to have in your pantry, maybe some potatoes or some green beans, and start with that. And um, I recommend making sure that whatever you're going to invest the time into can, that it's something that you will eat. There's no use putting all that work in if it's something that everyone in your family doesn't like to eat. But one good positive of canning is if you have a lot of vegetables canned in your pantry, you are more likely to eat vegetables when you are in a hurry. They're already fully cooked. They just need to be warmed up. So... You could go from um, a can of yams in the pantry to some, you know, smashed sweet potato yams for dinner in like five minutes. So it really helps to encourage you to eat vegetables even when you live a really busy life. So um, Don says, I've heard Nesco is good. I'm not familiar with that brand. Um, I have a Presto and I have a T-Fowl. Those are the two I've used. I, I know a lot of people love the All-American canner because it is American made. It has no plastic parts, but it is a premium canner it's very expensive so um that would be something to look into if you wanted if you had the money to spend up front and you wanted something really really nice or if you knew you loved canning and wanted to invest that kind of money uh tomatoes are pretty easy they only need to be water bath canned since they're naturally acidic yes so uh when it comes to preserving food in a canner there's pressure canning which is uh your meats and most of your vegetables and some fruits <laughs> based on acidity level. And there is also water bath canner, which is basically you put your jars in a big boiling pot of water. Um, and you can do that with anything that's a high acid food. So that's uh, tomato products, that is um, jellies, a lot of fruit-based products. Um, and water bath canning is great because you're not building any pressure. You really don't even need a specialty canner. You could use just a really big pot. Um, and the times in the canner are a lot shorter. One tip I do have if you're canning anything that's a tomato product is that put your tomatoes in the freezer and then take them out to defrost just a little bit and those tomato peels will fall right off and you don't have to boil your tomatoes to peel them. It's a it's hundred times easier and you don't burn your fingers, which is great. Um, and my other canning saying I have, there's a saying in life that says don't put off for tomorrow what you can do today. But for canning, if you're gardening, put off for tomorrow what you don't have to do today because uh, there are certain things that when you pick them, you have to can them. Like green beans, they kind of need to get canned in a hurry. And you have a few days to do it after you pick it. But tomatoes, I can just pick them as they're coming, throw them in. I save old bread bags, throw them in the freezer. And then in the fall, when I have saved just pounds and pounds and pounds of tomatoes, then I can them. Worry about the things that absolutely have to be canned immediately save the rest for later when you are less busy in the slower times of the year. Uh, so loud tonight, dude. Let's see. Let's catch up. Silver, uh, colored green beans are fun for kids to watch because they go in purple and they come out all green. Yes, and my kids were really disappointed. We had purple green beans and then I cooked them and they were green and the kids were like, what? This isn't what I picked. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of a bummer. Carrie said, I love canning videos. They're my favorite. Love to try something new every year. Not sure what I'm doing this year yet, other than perfectly perfecting stinker. crunchy pickles. And I know the key to crunchy pickles, I believe, is making sure you have the right Stop variety. He has some snackies right there. Don't 
those yogurt bites. Oh. Uh, Tammy says, first thing I ever made was strawberry jam, then spaghetti sauce, and dill pickles. I agree, though all the same pretty much. They are. Um, just follow the step-by-step -step instructions. You'll be fine. Do not get creative in your canning life. That's when it gets a little bit dangerous. Uh, do the star jars have to sit in a rack in the pot? No. So the rack makes it easier so you don't burn yourself trying to get them in and out. Um, what they do recommend, though, is if you don't have a rack in your pot, if you're just using a giant stock pot, you can put like a face cloth towel on the bottom so that uh, the jars sit in the boiling water on top of the towel. Sometimes if they sit directly in contact with the metal um, of your pot, because that's going to be directly in contact with your burner, it can be really, really hot and it could crack a jar. So if you put a towel down, just a small little square towel, it'll kind of be a buffer, but you do not have to have the lifting rack that just keep, saves your fingers, it makes it easier to make sure all the jars go in nice and standing up. That's a great question. Um, okay. That was my whirlwind introduction to canning. I'm thinking about making a video that's like the step-by-step -step beginner's guide to canning. So maybe I will Maybe I will do that one of these days. Though I do try to make sure when I make a canning video that I, I try to explain everything all the way through. So if you've never done it before, you can feel pretty confident. Uh, do you have anything to add to the canning? No. No? Okay. And uh, yeah, get to canning. That's my favorite way to make things shelf stable. Uh, the question no. I get a lot is how, how long is it shelf stable? It's recommended within two years is best quality, but honestly, as long as the seal is good, it's a vacuum in there, so pretty much forever. So yeah. here, you got one right here. I will say too, um, like Laura was saying, some people are afraid to do it, and some people also are afraid to have the kids help, but um, you can have your kids help in either the preparation mm -hmm. or packing of the jars. Uh, some of that stuff too that's not necessarily the dangerous part where you're uh, checking the dial and you know releasing the pressure and some of that yeah. stuff where you could get burned and stuff uh, kids kids enjoy just like adults kids enjoy seeing the fruits of their labor so to speak yep so silver moon that's actually goes us right into what I want to talk about next which is freezing and one of the biggest thumbs down for freezing is that you have to, it's not if you lose electricity or if your appliance dies, it's when. And it always happens when you have an absolutely fully stocked freezer and then it is a mad dash rush to try to save everything. Um, so freezing though can be a really good way to preserve things, especially things that don't can well. Um, you think about like broccoli, you can't can broccoli, I'll just fall apart and be gross. Um, but you can blanch it and freeze it um, if you, and then you will have just loads of broccoli in your freezer. Um, let's see, let's catch up. Tara says, can I use my own recipes to can pasta sauce or have to follow something official? So you don't have to, you, you don't have to do anything. I mean, um, one of the things that you have to be careful about um, is just really familiarize yourself with what things determine canning times. So for example, if you were making your own pasta sauce and you wanted to add meat into it, if you were just to Google, how long do I pressure can pasta, or how long do I water bath can pasta sauce, right? It might be like 20 minutes, but because you added meat into it, now you have to pressure can it. And now it has to be in for 90 minutes. So it just depends what you're adding. Um, even adding something like mushrooms will change the canning time. It'll also change the acidity, so now it needs to be pressure canned. So if you're brand new to canning, um, you just you want gotta to be, do a little homework. You gotta do a little homework first. Canning. And like Tara, you know me. If you ever have questions, you want to show me the recipe. I can tell you like if it has to, if that's something you still water bath can or pressure can. I could show that to you. And that's really as you go through it and as you can more and more things, you really kind of learn the ropes and it's. You, you can kind of look at a recipe and be like, oh yeah, I could pressure can that safely. Um, the biggest things you want to stay away from pressure canning, if it's your own recipe, are things with thickeners in them. You don't want to thicken a soup until you're actually going to eat it. So don't add flour and then can it. Just do it after you've canned it and are ready to open it back up eating. Don't add things that expand with the exception of beans. So please don't add rice or noodles. Um, Eggplant expands um, those things. They cause the pressure inside the jar to change. It doesn't get as hot, so you could end up harboring some botulism, which would not be a fun experience. Yeah, so. that's the big no-no. No botulism. So, Ira says, I use my oven to sterilize my jars after I've washed them and keep them hot. Yes, so 
the ideal thing is that you wash them in the dishwasher, keep the dishwasher closed, and your jars are nice and hot to be loaded with whatever you're canning. But if you're like me or like Iris Lady and you maybe don't have a dishwasher, you can wash them in hot soapy water, put them in the oven on 225 and just 20 minutes at least, and then just keep them hot until you're ready to use them. You never want to load a cold jar. Okay, if you put boiling whatever in a cold jar, it's going to explode everywhere and you're going to get burned. So make sure your jars are nice and warm. So Carrie says, I'm still eating beans that I canned in 2014. I do beans in the winter and I can 25 pounds of beans at a time. Nice. So as long as the seal is good, I mean, it, like I said, it's a vacuum in there. It just kind of pauses time. The quality can diminish a little bit, especially if there's any sunlight getting into your pantry or if your temperature is not really stable. Um, but yeah. <coughs> JB says, 42 watch and only 26 thumbs up. Time to click the thumbs up and help yeah. these fine Thank folks. Thank you. Thumbs Thanks. up if you have a, have a minute. True. All right. Free, let's do freezing, <laughs> and then I'm going to save the other two for next week. My, for, we'll talk about hardening off, which is things like your onions, so that they last all year until you're ready to grow more. And then we'll talk about, like, the dehydrating and the vacuum sealing and that kind of stuff next time. But freezing. So the big con, like I said, is appliances are going to fail you or electricity is going out. It's um, always at the worst time. It, yeah, too. it's always at the worst like, time. Or like you got no money to replace it, or you got nothing to do with your six hundred pounds of beef you just there's bought. There's two feet of snow outside, and you're mm -hmm. like, well, we can't get anywhere with this food. You know, take it somewhere or get a generator or whatever. So, and also another kind of thumbs down for <clears throat> for the freezing is a lot of times you have to use plastic. Plastic is just the best agent for keeping out freezer burn so if you're going to be keeping something longer than like a month or two in your deep freezer it's really got to need to be in plastic with all the air squeezed out butcher paper does okay for your meats but still it's not as good as plastic so that that creates a lot of waste and it is kind of a large upfront investment um, you got to have room to freeze things so i know like um Justin Rhodes, we really enjoy his channel. They had something like 11 freezers. I don't know, they had a bunch. Because uh, she didn't know how to pressure can. She's now learned how to pressure can, and that's pretty cool. So they've kind of more diversified how they store things. But all I could think about was like, gosh, 11 freezers. Like, that's a humongous financial investment. Oh, and oh, and uh, like, that's really <clears throat> awesome. Like, if you can do that, or even if you have space to put all those. Um, but m most people, even just buying one extra freezer, it would be a large investment. And so if, if you don't already have one, sometimes freezing isn't a good option for you. Yeah, I will say the one of the benefits of freezing over canning is that it's super fast. Like, yeah. you chop it up, put it in a bag, and you're done. And with canning... You know, you can only do so many jars at a time. Mm -hmm. You have to stay there and you have to monitor it the whole time. So they do have pros and cons. With freezing, you just put it in your bag, put it in the freezer, and you're you're done with it. You don't you don't have to spend all that time, maybe not quite as much time prepping it, and for sure not as much time, you know, working on your jars mm -hmm. and then uh, making sure you don't. It's, yeah, it's make definitely things faster explode. up yeah. up front. A silver moon, great question. Can you use those reusable silicone bags in the freezer? And yes, you can. And I love them. And that's what most of my frozen stuff is in. But again, it's definitely more expensive than the plastic. But you can reuse them over and over again. Um, so when you freeze things, though, um, like right now in my freezer, I have a lot of spinach that we grew. And what the only thing I did with that was rinse it. And then I just shoved it all in the silicone Ziploc bags. Um, because with spinach, I just like to break off a piece of the clump and then sprinkle it in whatever I'm cooking. But if it's something that you want to make sure that you can count how many that you're getting of each item, you want to freeze it like maybe your strawberries. Freeze them on a cookie sheet. And once they're frozen, you pop them off of the cookie sheet and you put them in a Ziploc baggie like that. And that prevents them from freezing as a large, uh, just a large glob of whatever. So you can just take out what you need instead of having just a frostable uh, bag. Holly says freezing some foods in water prevents freezer burn. So I have never done I that. What, I didn't know that. What either. kind of foods do you freeze in water? I would be curious what uh, what you do. That's interesting. And then Tara says, I currently just freeze everything, but do worry okay. about the power going out. Yeah, that is always kind of a worry. I mean, like nowadays, a lot of people do have generators mm -hmm. and things like that. And honestly, I will say for where we live, like, I feel like they're great service as far as if the power does go out, it's usually back on within an hour. Like, they're super, super fast uh, getting the power back on for us. But anyway. Yeah, uh, Beth says we do flash <laughs> freezing for bell peppers. So I love freezing for peppers. I love freezing 
but I do can peppers too. I love freezing for spinach. I do not can spinach, I only freeze it. I love freezing for fresh berries so then they can be enjoyed later in like yogurt or on a, a really hot day. Um, and I, and I freeze um, the green tops of my onions and the tops of my carrots because I'll use those when I cook as well. Um, a lot of greens. I just, I don't can greens. You don't like, you call it wilty lettuce. He's not a big yeah, fan of cooked not, greens. not my favorite. So I, I don't can it because then it's just, then you kind of just have to cook it, I don't know, as a big glob. But if by freezing it, I can kind of mix it in crumple it up and mix it in casseroles and things. Uh, Adele says, fish we freeze in water, especially salmon. Okay. And Holly says, fish, veggies, and some fruits. This is something I'm going to have to learn more about because I don't know a lot yeah. about this. Work on some new techniques. Um, and one of the other positives with freezing is that you can actually freeze whole meals. And this is a way to really help you um, if you're in a really busy um, phase of life. So, you know, maybe you only have one day this week where you have time to really cook a home, you know, a full meal. You know, see if you could make three of those. Eat one tonight and then freeze two for the, you know, sometime in the future. And you've got a, a nice home cooked meal um, already stacked in your freezer. And, and it's like, you know, Swanson's TV dinner. You just slide it in the oven. It does take a little bit of time to cook through a frozen dinner. But then you've got, you know, your, your green beans and your carrots and everything's all frozen in a nice tray for everyone to that, enjoy. That works well. And it... That works well for our life right now, too, because there are times when Laura isn't here and she can tell either me or the girls to pop something mm -hmm. in the uh, oven, you know, and then when we're all home, it's finally cooked. Yep. I mean, just so tonight, cool. Micah made, like I told her, at 5.15, I need you to make vegetables for dinner because everything else will be ready. And, you know, she was able just to get, you know, it's really easy. You just get it from the freezer and she warmed it up on the stove for us and she's, you know, she's nine. And she was able to do that all, I think, without help. Did she? Yeah, did she need she help? Did no. Her, so. so that that's the nice thing with the freezer. Um, it, it really, you know, you can be prepared and people can help even when you're not home to do it. Uh, let's see, do you have anything else? Oh, freezing eggs is also um, a popular thing to do. And there's lots of different ways to do it that's safe. Some people crack them into ice cube trays. And then once they're frozen, they pop them out of the ice cube tray into Ziploc bag. I like to scramble two at a time and freeze those in breast milk storage bags. It's just like the perfect size and then I have a little like Tupperware container in the freezer and I just stack them standing up and then all of my baking recipes usually use two eggs. So then in the middle of winter when I want to bake I can still have my farm fresh eggs and I just pull a pack out, defrost it a little and then throw it in the batter. Tammy says my husband bought me a freezer for my twins first birthday. That way, I didn't have to go to the store as much. Sweetest gift ever. They are 17. We use it for mostly meat and summer crops. Awesome. And then Carrie says, I have a question. If you freeze two cups of zucchini, then you thaw it, and it's watery, so you squeeze it out, uh, but then it's only one cup. So mm -hmm. if the recipe calls for two cups, are you still okay? Makes sense. Mm. It does make sense. So I would just think about it. If the recipe called for two cups and it was two raw cups, the recipe would assume your zucchini is going to cook and shrink. You've already done the shrink part ahead of time. So I would just use what was originally two cups. It's already been pre-cooked, and that's your two, two cups, even though it doesn't measure out to two cups anymore. That, that makes sense? Um, that's what I do. That makes sense. Um, okay. Let's see, a couple other things that can help just as far as not having as much of a headache if you're using freezers. They make thermometers that you put inside your freezer that can actually alert your phone um, that it's an over temp, which could give you a heads up, especially like we don't use our deep freeze every day. It could right. go out and I would have no idea because I didn't check it. And then you don't know how long it's been out and you don't know if you have to throw everything away. I know some, so. some uh, like, I don't know what I would call them fancier freezers, but like ours is pretty plain Jane, but some of them will like beep or emit a noise if they're mm -hmm. open to alert you. Ours <laughs> ours just has a light on the very bottom. If it's open, it's like a red light instead oh, of a green beeps. light. Oh, does it? It does beep. beep? Oh, mm -hmm. It beeps. We won't, huh? We've had that f for a year? Yeah, a little more than a year. Okay, and then the last thing is uh, there's a free <clears> app. It's called No Waste. You can download on your phone and it's free and it just lets you make an inventory of your pantry and I use it for my deep freezer, um, especially when we had a chest freezer because it becomes a great abyss of the unknown of what's in there yeah. and it helps you remember yeah. what you've put in there. Who knows what's on the bottom of a chest and freezer. And how long it's been in there because you can put dates on it and then 
it, it, you can even like search it by date so it can be like hey you put a whole chicken in there eight months ago you might want to get that bad boy out tonight for dinner or whatever and it just helps you make sure you're cycling through and are not losing things in your freezer and forgetting that they're in we there, do so. like uh we've had a chest freezer and an upright freezer and i do see the benefits of both but the upright freezer is so handy in getting it is out I know they're not as efficient as the deep freezes, but... Well, it's also nice, too, because the kids can help. Like, with That's the true. deep freezer, they couldn't... They couldn't even, like, barely see over the top and and pull something out. Like, if I am cooking and I'm like, oh, can you give me some frozen green beans? Like, you know, Annie, who's five, can go out there and pull it off the door, you know. She would not be able to get something out of a deep freezer. She's too short. So that, right. that's nice. And it's much easier to keep organized, like you said. Uh, yeah. So, anyway, that's part part one. We'll do part two next week. I just really... I'm so passionate about, like, food security. Like, there's... There are... Um, there's so many things that you can do to make sure that your pantry's well stocked. And that is something that can just take a lot of stress out of your life when you're going through hard times that, like... Whatever the struggle is, at least you know there's going to be food on the table every day. Um, and I just, I feel like that's something that's kind of been lost in our culture. Even when you like walk through newer homes, they never have pantries. Like, where do people put their food? Mm -hmm. But it's because people don't stock pantries, they don't stock food anymore. They just start, they, you know, it's the lifestyle of the grocery store is always going to be there. Well, you know, is it? You know, or are you going to be able to get there even if food's always in the grocery store? So you should always be at least a little bit planned ahead. I really encourage you to consider what ways that you can do that. Yeah, and I want to stress too, like, this isn't something... I mean, sometimes you do need to spend a chunk of money mm -hmm. to accomplish a goal or to get something done. But a lot of this stuff isn't isn't something where you need to just go and spend $2,000 yeah. to try and make this happen. Every but, week... You can definitely do this in tiny little mm -hmm. chunks if you if you plan it out. Uh, now, if you do want to, like, build a big pantry or mm -hmm. get all the best uh, canning supplies and stuff, yeah, you'll be out some and if you, but... if you don't have a good, if you don't have a big pantry spot, I think it's uh, Lady, um, Iris Lady maybe is the one who said this last time, but, you know, her parents had a tiny house. They actually stored their canned goods. They put their master bed up on a riser a little bit and then they stored all their jars under the master bed because they didn't have a big pantry so mm -hmm. you can get creative you can get creative about your storage space um without it really being in the way either just you know food security <clears throat> is really it's an important thing and it's something i think we can all do a little bit at a time and there's lots of ways to do it which is what we're talking about that, that's one reason why we wanted to kind of move out here and homestead we feel like uh, canning and things like that mm -hmm. uh, that's a tool that's kind of been lost uh, through the generations not as many people do it and back in the day nearly everybody did it uh, and so that's one reason why we wanted to move to Homestead is to learn some of those things and try and teach our kids right. how to do it. Alright, Iris Lady says that wasn't her so it's probably Lady in the Mountains then who is here sometimes. I know it was Lady somebody. All right, uh, I think we're going to call it good for tonight. Sam here has to finish his studying, and we have a bunch of little people who need to go to bed. So thanks so much for watching. We will finish this next week. I hope you can join us. Have Bye, a good everybody. Night. Thanks, thanks for, for coming. watching. You guys take care.